Good afternoon. This is Eric Mucklow, host of the Sustainability and Energy web webinar series for 2015. Uh, I welcome all of you who are joining us today. Uh, this session it will be recorded and can be viewed online at a later date on our uh, Mercy site or on the YouTube channel with the uh, address shown on the screen there. Uh, the YouTube channel is not uh, searchable, but if you follow that link, uh, you'll be able to see uh, most of our past webinars and uh, usually uploaded a couple weeks or so after the uh, session is held uh, for a refresher or to uh, help with your uh, quizzes if you are pursuing AI credits or learning units, CEUs. Uh, to earn those, we do them in batches of five webinars. Uh, go online to the Mercy's website, those of you who are internal to the core, and download the quizzes, fill them out, and send them in to the s underscore e webinar at usace.army.mil uh, email address and those will be reviewed and if you got your questions properly and sent your AIA number uh, we will register those for you and, uh, and get you started on credit for these courses. Uh, <clears throat> with us today we have Nicholas Ander Alexander. Uh, he's a construction representative out of the Omaha district uh, stationed at Fort Carson. He has a number of years experience in high performance building envelope, uh, envelopes as well as the construction and testing of several dozen buildings on Fort Carson. Uh, Fort Carson has been very forward-leaning in energy and uh, sustainability. And basically, uh, he was pivotal in developing the e ECB that we put out last year with the uh, QA guide for building envelopes that uh, he and I and a cadre of people worked on. It's a very uh, thorough document, those of you who, have, who haven't seen it, and we are in the process now. It's going up for a final signature to get issued as a permanent uh, engineering pamphlet as a part of the QA uh, representatives guide series. So today uh, Nicholas is speaking about QA representatives guide the building envelopes from the ECB and it's going to educate you and your staff on the importance in the field for the proper QA over the construction of high performance buildings and across a wide array of the features of the envelope uh, that the envelope features contain. Uh, major topics will include what the purpose of the document is and how its use and some of the content in the document to help guide you as you review construction documents and construction activities in the field to make sure that all these various layers of components are fitting all together to form one complete system as the building envelope. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Nicholas Alexander. All right, excellent. Thanks, Eric. Uh, I just want to welcome everybody uh, to the presentation here. Hopefully, uh, everybody takes away uh, a little bit of something uh, from the presentation and uh, and you know hopefully is uh, you know a little bit uh, enlightened about this document and and what it, the attempt to to capture in it was so with that we'll get started here um, as Eric uh, mentioned uh, you know I've I've worked here on Fort Carson for a number of years and had a lot of uh, field experience with uh, construction of high performance building envelopes. Uh, one of my, my most focused efforts has been on the, the air barrier uh, system, the air vapor and uh, water control layers. Uh, and, and here on Fort Carson specifically, we've had well over uh, 40, upwards of 50 buildings that we've done over the last few years that have had successful air barrier systems. Um, both installed and tested, but the you know the overall envelope isn't just about that. There's a whole a whole number of things that are important uh, in ensuring that you know for these high performance uh, buildings uh, that we we ensure that the construction is good and and that that's going to ultimately uh, meet our our uh, energy goals. So really, the root of this was um, you know trying to get something out there into the Corps of Engineers about this topic and this ultimately this uh, ECB and this uh, engineer pamphlet ultimately an engineer pamphlet was sort of the end product of that idea and ultimately you know really what we intended to do uh, we released this as an ECB and uh, and get it out there for folks to, to take a peek at uh, and the focus was on you know the, the quality assurance rep 
you know what we should be looking at in uh, in a three phase control process uh, the whole variety of different components of the envelope from you know exterior claddings uh, roof coverings thermal bridging uh, in, you know the thermal envelope even even how those things are incorporated into various wall types so we we did end up producing a relatively large document and um, here on the next slide, it, it kind of gets into one of the important aspects that, that folks need to understand about this document is that, you know, it's uh, it's a guide. You know, you get uh, you get out there and, and you run across something that you haven't seen before on an initial inspection or on a follow-up inspection or just out during a, uh, you know, a, a, a daily uh, quality and, and QA presence walk on the site. Uh, the intent of this document is to be a reference. Uh, I went out there and I saw, well, we've got this issue going on. I haven't seen that one before. Well, maybe I can find that in the guide and, and, and use it as a tool in the toolbox. So overall, the, the intent of the document is, uh, is to help our QA staff you know, really kind of know what needs to be looked at, you know, how, how to apply these, these various things and ensure that we have a, a successful construction of the envelope and, um, you know, and, and, the, and, and use this tool as, as much as possible. Um, it's, it's not, I think one of the things that needs to be clear is it's, it's not a mandated directive of QA requirements. It's, it's essentially like a reference document that when you need, when you got a question and you have nowhere else to turn, you can turn to this and, and find the information, hopefully. Um, so it, it is intended, you know, for the QA staff out in the field and their, their role in mind, but it's certainly not limited to that. You know, oftentimes, uh, really just about anyone, uh, designers, architects, engineers, you know, when they kind of understand what the folks are looking at in the field, it may give them some insight into how to uh, approve, improve their designs ultimately. So it can be used by a lot of folks, but its its principal intent was for field use uh, for our QA staff. And, and with that in mind, you know, you know, our designers and, and folks are, are more than welcome to look through this and kind of get an idea, but it definitely is not a design guide. Um, you know, there's, there's, you know, definitely uh, issues that come up in designs with regard to quality and application and different things, but it, it definitely is not a design guide. You, you wouldn't want to refer to this as a, as a design, uh, design document. And on the, on the same, and it, it's not an all-inclusive guide. You know, there's we ended up with about 90 plus pages in this document, and uh, you could you could write many many hundreds of pages on this subject probably. But we tried to include as much of the most applicable information as possible to uh, to try and help folks solve real field issues or find actual uh, problems and and relay that into a document for reference. So it's it's still going to be, you know, construction is definitely a, uh, a multifaceted piece of, of the overall process of a building. And so, you know, there may be instances where folks need to, to ask other people, ask the designers, what was their intent, ask, you know, material manufacturers, well, your product is doing X, Y, and Z, and and things like that. So, uh, you know, it's a good reference, but if you get into a pinch and can't find uh, what you're looking for, then, you know, you certainly want to be able to, uh, you know, expand out and, 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 you know, involve others as, as needed. <laughs> All right, so you know, we've got a few other corollary documents here that, uh, you know, try and are, are kind of trying to be a family of documents. Uh, we've got the UFCs, um, particularly the UFC, ar the architecture UFC uh, 3-101-01, and it uh, it kind of outlines the big picture intent and requirements 
for building envelopes and particularly in the air barrier um, uh, applications. So that's definitely a good document uh, to be familiar with, uh, particularly when uh, you might have a design build contract and you know QA folks or or you know other folks in the office are, are doing uh, BCOES design reviews uh, before a project comes up. So you can, can have a feel for what is actually expected uh, from the UFC. Uh, we've also got this uh, the second UFC here, 1-200-02, uh, High Performance and Sustainable Building Requirements. So, you know, they, they all kind of tie together and, and it's important to understand the, the metrics of, of what we're trying to get at and to, uh, to meet, re, you know, the requirements and expectations of the of the USCs and the various um, uh, laws that were incorporated a number a few years back uh, in order to achieve you know high performance and, and sustainable buildings and uh, finally there we have just our, our ECB 2012-16 uh, which uh, outlines um, you know the air tightness and air barrier continuity requirements you know that one has expired uh, but is a very good reference tool and and is an inclusion in the um, in the uh, the guide here is uh, a lot of the language from the uh, that document there so the, the the test protocol so definitely a good reference uh, reference tool to look back on and, and understand uh, what the expectation is and, and where this is is coming from Okay, so just kind of diving into uh, you know the, the content uh, a little bit here of the guide. Um, chapter one really really kind of discusses you know the overall picture of where this guide is is meant to fit into the uh, the QA uh, responsibility set, and and it is applicable over. You know a lot of different project types. You know new construction, renovation, retrofit. All the all really those three those three are the biggies there, and and it's really centered around the three phase control process. You know for the QA staff out in the field, that's that's kind of the meat and potatoes of our day to day work. You know we uh, you know we attend uh, prep meetings. We expect the contractors to follow the three phase control process when they're uh, building a project and and not only expect but it's contractually required so there's there's a, a centrism around this three phase control process that's kind of written into this document to to kind of give it applicability to you know the QA's daily responsibilities so you know of that you know we've got our three phase uh, control or our preparatory phase you know submittal reviews that that preparatory meeting uh, and all the the components that go into that, the discussion of drawings, uh, the re, you know the review of specs for a feature of work, obviously safety, any kind of uh, you know particular applications of materials and so on. So everything that kind of is encompassed in the three phase control process, you know, preparatory, the initial initial phase where you know you may have uh, gone out and looked at your initial sample of work and identified that there's a you know maybe a need for DOR input or, or we've got deficiencies or the contractor isn't clear on what he's doing and things from the preparatory meeting have, have not flowed out into the field so and then and then that that continual follow-up phase of, of monitoring the work so really that's kind of the the structure of how uh, the backbone and the structure of how this guide was written. All right, so on to chapter two. You know, talking a little bit about the the content here, uh, what's in here, and and what do we got, and you know, ultimately we've we've got a limited number, you know, a limited time here to to kind of talk about some of these things, but just to give you an idea of what some of the content is and, and you know where it's going. Um, in chapter two we talk about exterior cladding you know and uh, kind of give you some 
some information about those different uh, different aspects of the uh, of the exterior cladding assemblies you might actually see out there in the field. So our first uh, first point here is you know where is the moisture resistant layer in your wall assembly? Okay, so different wall systems locate that moisture resistant layer at different locations within the wall. You know depending on uh, what type of of uh, exterior cladding you have, is it a, a is it a face seal? Is it you know a, a preassemble or a prefabricated metal uh, assembly? Is it brick? Uh, and and what are the different components of that assembly and how does it behave and and what are its uh, deficiencies and things you can find. So, you know, for some of these wall systems, you know, that that moisture resistant layer may be at the face of the cladding, you know, the exterior skin. It could be behind the cladding, such as uh, a sheet film product like Tyvek or a spray applied um, uh, control layer, uh, air, water, and uh, vapor control layer. Um, or if if the wall type has a is you know is a typical maybe we call a, um, a brick cavity wall where we've got a, a face and then an airspace and then you know your control layer. So one critical thing to understand is that you know where that uh, layer is in the wall assembly has a huge impact on the performance of that wall from both the interior climate and the exterior climate uh, where the, uh, where that building is. So it's a little bit more elaborated on in, in the guide, but certainly, um, you know, where that, that location is is important and important to understand how it's supposed to be built and what some of the flaws might, uh, might be when it comes up to, uh, when it comes to actually uh, building or placing or installing these materials. So. You know, we talk a little bit about critical inspection points. Okay, we've got transitions of joints and fasteners, window openings, you know, penetrations, and, and it's important to really look at at where that moisture resistant layer is, and and it it's oftentimes difficult for folks to to make the correlation, but sometimes that single material, that uh, that Tyvek layer, that sheet film layer, or that spray applied layer. If it's right directly on the outside of the building, which is the, the correct location in about 99% of applications, you know, it, it's critical that that, uh, that that assembly be installed correctly and, and be really free of deficiencies and damage. And, and it's, uh, it's oftentimes that material that acts in, in, for three different, in the three different um, arenas of control, which is uh, air control, uh, liquid moisture control, and vapor. And, you know, air and vapor are, are one and the same. Obviously, you have, you have water molecules in the air floating around, and if your, your material there is dis, discontinuous or has holes or flaws, uh, that air that's getting through is transporting moisture into that uh, through that assembly or out of that assembly from the interior and those that that one transport mechanism is the cause of probably 95 percent of uh, major failures of building envelopes so it's critical to keep in mind that that one layer may perform all three functions and uh, it's really critical to remember that so undamaged free of deficiencies and continuous. And continuity is critical. If you have discontinuity and gaps and spaces and tears or rips or holes and pockets, you are essentially, you know, having places where that uh, air, water, or vapor can get through. So continuity is critical and, and a close inspection of those assemblies when they're coming together is very important to, to be out there with your, your contractor and, and looking at during the three-phase process. All right, roof coverings. You know, there's a lot of components that can go into different roof types. Your, uh, your membrane roofs, your sloped roof applications, asphalt, 
you know, roofs, shingles, you know, depending on what kind of prod, uh, product you are, are working with, you know, that roof covering is, is very important. Um, you know, th there's a chapter in here talking about some of the, you know, nuance, uh, nuances of different material applications and, and things in there. And, and there's a lot to talk about there, but really some of the, the critical and points to, to take away is that uh, when we're having a continuous air, vapor, and moisture control layer uh, in that wall assembly, and preferably on that, well, not preferably, uh, it, almost always on the exterior face of the wall uh, to the outside, you've got to make sure that that whole envelope is continuous, and it's got to interface with you know, your roof covering um, assemblies. So some of these critical inspection points, not just for uh, moisture intrusion, but also for that air and that, uh, air, that vapor laden air transport into the, into the assemblies. Uh, so your, your terminations and transitions, where your roof and wall uh, connections meet, uh, any kind of joints or, or lap conditions uh, sealant locations such as uh, you know roof davits for fall protection or vent stack pipes or any number of things that might be coming up through that roof um, you know drip edges and flashing you know making sure that our drip edges are uh, are, are draining properly and don't have uh, failures in the seals or not properly installed you know, skylights and tubular daylighting devices. If anyone's ever done a project where you've got um, uh, solar solar tubes and it's in a lot huge area, there could be a number of those uh, penetrations up on the roof. So really making sure that those things are, are sealed up and interfacing with all the components of the roof and, and possibly the wall assemblies is really critical. And, and that's the next point there is, again, that continuity you, know, you always want to be able to draw a continuous line of protection essentially around uh, these assemblies and you know that may be a bit of a circ you know, circuitous route around something or or you know whether it's in the roof or the wall but it that continuity is very important um, you know and, and understanding the behavior of the roof material you know, expansion, contraction, uh, uh, solar gain, solar reflectance, you know, uh, standing seam metal roofs uh, need to have that expansion capability for uh, movement and, you know, uh, what is the nature of the, of the membrane roof? You know, how does it get installed properly? You know, what are the critical, you know, uh, locations where you might have uh, leaks or failures or something. So making sure that, that that assembly is constructed properly, well inspected through the three-phase process, and ultimately uh, completed correctly. You know, another, another chapter here, chapter four, uh, deals with fenestrations. And, you know, the when you think about the building envelope and, and its performance, the best envelope is an envelope that has no penetrations. However, we put all kinds of penetrations through wall assemblies. We put windows, we put doors, we put skylights, this, that, and the other. So, you know, the, the interface with those uh, fenestrations really, really becomes critical in ensuring that continuity is, is maintained. So, um, you know, in, any kind of interface with, uh, with the control layers of the building envelope. You know, your air, vapor, and moisture barriers, you know, on that exterior face of the, uh, of the exterior building uh, envelope. Uh, if you have vapor barriers, you know, vapor barriers are kind of oftentimes a bit confusing for folks, but if you have maybe a, uh, a vapor barrier that's separating um, a conditioned space from an unconditioned space that's not included in your uh, in your overall building envelope, then you want to make sure it's it's 
uh, continuous or that it interfaces with uh, with those other assemblies. Uh, your insulation. Uh, I was involved with some research uh, over the last couple of years about thermal bridging and thermal performance of building envelopes and uh, ensuring that if a, if a high performance building envelope is designed and, and there are specific details in the drawings about insulation and how insulation interacts with window frames and, and window assemblies that those uh, craft and the, and the contractors installing those things don't deviate from those uh, designs because of oh well I've done it this way for 30 years or this is how we do it and we don't we don't need to follow that detail you know in, in high performance building envelopes particularly on the thermal bridge uh, reduction uh, side of things installing those details as they're shown in the drawings is really critical uh, to ensure that you get the performance that you're expecting and and it's very impressive about in how much energy is actually lost through thermal transfer of the building uh, components. And so insulation in a variety of different ways is uh, is really important in, in its application and its relationship to fenestrations. You know, review of, of the critical performance factors. When you're actually looking at the fenestration, the, the window itself, What's the U value? What, is, what are we expecting uh, from that U value? And, and does it correlate to the overall performance of the, of the envelope as, we, as we're looking at it? Um, is it the right kind of window? Um, you know, what, what are the uh, intentions with you know, solar heat gain coefficient? Our visible transmittance and, and the air leakage too. Uh, windows are oftentimes one of the most leakiest, uh, one of the leakiest uh, assemblies in the uh, when you're doing the air barrier test. Uh, doors obviously have uh, some some issue, you know just inherent leakiness, but but windows, uh, you know, they ultimately can account for a lot of surface area of your envelope. So you want to make sure that your your air leakage is not. Uh, not significant or or detrimental there in in that that assembly. Um, you know, thermal bridges. We included a section about thermal bridges in this uh, guide. You know, because that's becoming more and more of a of an aspect uh, for energy reduction as as the significance and the impact of thermal bridges. Is uh, is really understood, and um, you know the the Passive House Institute of a uh, in the U.S. has a very the Passive House standard is very robust, but it takes into consideration thermal bridges, um, and when you when you see the impact of how thermal bridges affect the overall energy performance, it really becomes clear why you know ensuring that the construction and and the design uh, the implementation of the design and the constructed product are the same because if you don't, then you know you're ultimately impacting the overall performance of the building. So it's really critical, um, you know, during the three phase process to get out there and and be clear, you know, be clear in the prep meeting what the expectation is and and following the design and. You know, and a really key point about windows, penetrations, and, and thermal bridges and different things is if you have any kind of shop drawings, you, know, you, you may have the design in the in the contract set, but you, if you're reviewing or you see or, you're, or you have a design build and that designer is reviewing those shop drawings, he needs to be sure that there's no changes between what the, the contract details are and what the actual construction uh, construction uh, shops are going to be because that's a very very common uh, pitfall that I found during prep meetings or uh, you know going out and doing that initial or a follow-up inspection is that we got two different places we're working from and and the expectation needs to be clear so you know thermal thermal insulation continuous thermal envelope and uh, you know, 
really getting out and doing, uh, you know, inspecting uh, with your QCs and, and through the three-phase process to ensure that those thermal bridge areas are being uh, constructed properly. So, you know, you get a few different uh, areas that, that really need special attention. Um, you know, any kind of exposed structure, or exterior structure that uh, penetrates that, that envelope. You know, there, in the high performance building envelope world, you kind of want to imagine, uh, you know, a layered system where you've got your insulation, you know, you've got your exterior uh, cladding, possibly an airspace in there, but then you have your thermal insulation, and then immediately behind that thermal insulation is your air vapor moisture control layer, and that's on your exterior uh, envelope substrate, you know, uh, exterior sheet, uh, sheet rock. And, and everything you should be inboard, you know, your structure and all these things should, as best as can be done, be inboard of that insulation layer because it prevents the, the, the major effects of thermal bridging. So, you know, uh, it's kind of like having a hole in your coat. If it's really cold and windy out and you've got a hole or a zipper, you know, it was broke or something on your coat and you can feel that air coming through and it's cooling you off, you know, that's a, that's a thermal bridge through the air. And, and, you know, it's the same kind of principle for our, our, uh, our building envelopes as you don't want that, those holes there to, to cause energy loss. Uh, eaves and, and ridges, you know, any kind of eave. Or uh, you know you have joist tails or uh, or uh, uh, truss tails that are going out and creating an eave. You know you've got a lot of penetrations there, and you know the impetus is on the designers to try and figure out a way to reduce that. But as field folks, we got to make sure that when it uh, comes down to, to building these things, you know our contractors are are building them correctly and. And we're out doing the three-phase process. We're we're seeing those issues, or we're ensure you know we're identifying uh, you know that things are being done correctly. So any kind of fenestration openings, uh, slabs. Uh, a very common uh, example for thermal bridges is uh, porches on apartment buildings, where they've got concrete slabs that uh, are continuous across the floor out to the edge. And, and that there's no separation between that exterior exposed portion of the slab and the interior. And, and that kind of uh, thermal bridge is very common and it, it actually saps a lot of energy out of, your, out of your house or out of your building. So the key point ultimately is that the QAR and, and in his or her uh, daily duties Ensuring that the contractor is following their contract and their details and or ensuring that if there are issues that they're corrected or addressed to the right people uh, to, to get corrected. You know, we kind of talked about thermal insulation and the different material types and what, you know, what... Uh, what you may see on a, any given construction project, and you've got a very, you know, various types. I think a lot of folks have seen uh, just about all of these. Uh, you know, you've got your your board stock insulation, you've got spray applied foams, you got fiberglass in varying applications. You know, uh, blocks or rolls or loose fill. Um, so you, when you're when you're looking at the different application types and the different materials. You know, going in and, and doing QA with your three-phase process and your contractor, making sure they've been installed right or applied right, uh, conditions are correct, you know, things aren't being stored in, a, in an improper environment, they're not wet, they're not exposed, um, things like that. You know, you want to you wanna go out and, and look for, you know, any kind of cracks or joints or some kind of failure or improper application, um, any kind of fastening, you know, uh, fasteners that might be penetrating that uh, that envelope and cotton creating a thermal bridge. Uh, chapter 7, we kind of talk about, uh, you know, your control layers, your air vapor and water control layers. Um, 
you know, the, the, the air barrier, if it were a singular unit uh, assembly, would essentially, you know, it, its purpose is to control that airflow between the, the exterior environment and the interior environment. Uh, you know, a, a vapor retarder, if you have a, a singular application for a vapor retarder, uh, it, its main purpose is to retard the transmission of water vapor, whether that's by you know uh, static diffusion or as a, as a mechanism of uh, air uh, airflow through an assembly. And those two are are not mutually exclusive. If you, air transport and and vapor are are one you know together combined. There are varying classes of uh, vapor retarder, and you know it's critical during the three-phase process. If you do have an application for this, that you know you look at the submittals, and and that's a component of this document as well. That you know what we should we be looking at for submittals, and and what are some of the key points uh, when in that preparatory meeting to look over submittals and make sure that the uh, the submittal and the material on site actually uh, match and are are being installed or uh, brought to the site properly. So got water resistive uh, barriers, um, you know, and I can't emphasize enough that oftentimes these, all three of these aspects are combined into one material on the exterior uh, face of the, of the uh, exterior envelope sheetrock under the insulation. And it's, it, it performs all three of these functions simultaneously and not mutually exclusively, but there are applications where one or the other of these things may be applied. So it's it's oftentimes one and the same material that performs three functions. Again, placement within the wall assembly is critical to prevent uh, moisture issues. Uh, and it's really important to pay close attention to substitutions. Uh, you know, if your contract has uh, uh, substitutions and an equal or equal material type uh, things in there and they can't get a hold of those, it's important that the QAs uh, and the QCs are familiar with that issue and, and either seek the design team's input from either design build or in-house design and, and ensure that, that substitution isn't going to affect the performance of the overall envelope. You know, water drainage. Uh, you know, a general rule is everything should drain towards the exterior, uh, out, down, and away. Uh, you don't want anything that can turn the corner and get trapped inside of, a, of an assembly or is draining to the assembly or, or anything like that. So making sure that your flashings um, you know, are directing water to the exterior. Your drainage cavity is not obstructed by mortar droppings or trash or other things that can retain water in that wall assembly. Um, you know, making sure that, that airspace uh, can can drain and ventilate the wall if, if that's what kind of uh, assembly you have. Making sure your weep holes are, are installed and that oftentimes can get overlooked and or that those weep holes aren't obstructed by mortar or or something else if, if that's kind of your, if that's what type of wall you have. So definitely a design system and it should direct that water to the exterior. Um, you know, you definitely don't want to rely entirely on sealants to keep water out. So good drip edge flashings, you know, bent plates, uh, properly flashed windows, properly installed uh, window assemblies with the drains unobstructed. All of those moisture uh, water draining features, including draining water away from your site. You know, ICC requires a 2% grade uh, drainage grade away from a building. That is an interesting, uh, you know, it's not in the slide, but that's an interesting aspect because if water isn't draining away from your building, it can accumulate and work its way into the walls, under the foundation, under the floors. And it also can create a lot of evaporation and vapor around the building, which can ultimately, if you've got a, a poor envelope, uh, that air moisture relationship transport into the wall can, can cause uh, water damage. So that's just another feature in the, in the guide here that, that 
we've tried to cover. You know, towards the back of the guide, we've talked about some of the major wall types. Obviously, there's a lot of different things out there, but you know, we really tried to hit on the, the main high performance and sustainable building wall types. Uh, insulated concrete forms, ICF, that's a that's one that is uh, is definitely making a, a more of a presence out in the uh, in the world. You know, your typical cold cold st uh, form steel framing, your typical stud cavity wall, uh, CMU walls. Precast, tilt up, um, you know, autoclaved aerated concrete, all of these things, uh, there's little, uh, there's sections in here about those different wall types and their performance and, and QA um, uh, aspects. Uh, you know, the guide kind of covers the storage and protection of materials aspects, you know, making sure uh, you're not, uh, you know, leaving all of your materials out to get saturated in the, in the weather and that they're covered or they're off the ground, um, uh, you know, your, your UV exposure to foams, you know, uh, spray applied foam can't be exposed to UV for very long uh, because it will degrade and start uh, coming apart and so, you know, uh, wind exposure is a common issue with uh, sheet film products where the, the wind gets a corner loose and it blows really hard and it just shreds that material so it's definitely uh, critical that you know when you're out and about uh, you know doing your your QA inspections and three-phase process that you're looking for these things and and seeing what the uh, effects of, of uh, you know various elements are you know you definitely want to make sure that your your insulation materials and all of these components fit and, and uh, there's continuity particularly with your control layers and your insulation. Uh, towards the end of the of the uh, guide, as I mentioned before, is the air leakage test protocol. This used to be in the ECB, but we've we've tried to embody this uh, document into this uh, EP to ensure that uh, you know folks have access to this and you know uh, can kind of understand if maybe they've never done an air barrier test how that's supposed to work and, and what the process is. So uh, it covers a lot of different things, you know, what your testing requirements are, what uh, our, uh, our building uh, performance value is, 0.25 CFM uh, per square foot at 75 pascals, uh, you know, what required submittals may be, you know, witnessing these things, uh, you know, knowing the boundaries of your, of your air barrier envelope, that whole building testing, you know, how to, how to address individual rooms, uh, test spaces, you know, large buildings, all that stuff, you know, that uh, the QAs are involved with when it comes to testing day on, on a building. Uh, air leakage specification, so, uh, you know, making sure that, you know, we, we've included in there in Chapter 11 that the air leakage spe uh, specification and making sure that things are built, designed, tested in accordance with that uh, specification. Um, you know, the, the, the test essentially consists of, um, you know, basically measuring a flow rate uh, by an induced pressure through the envelope, uh, both in a positive and negative fashion. And we do that over a series of points uh, across of varying pressures and ultimately we get uh, a, a value and uh, the standard right now is 0.25 CFM per square foot at 75 pascals uh, though a lot of um, designs here in, on Fort Carson are, and out of the Omaha district have been lowering that of, of their own uh, desires to uh, help improve the energy performance because Car Fort Carson is a net zero pilot uh, installation for all three aspects, uh, energy, water, and waste. So um, you may see different values for that, something less, but it has the minimum expectation is 0.25 CFM per square foot at 75 pascals. So you may see some variation there, but um, you know, we've, in we've included that in here in case uh, in case you're not familiar or have never done that before and can kind of get a, a baseline idea of how that works and, and what the, the pitfalls and, and things can be.
Uh, we included in there a, a testing agency guide, you know, the, the testing protocol, what uh, the equipment is, uh, you know, fan layout, approved testing plans, you know, that's, that's one of those things in the three-phase process in the prep. You know, if you've got a submittal for a testing plan, it's got to be approved and ready to go and, and discussed at that preparatory meeting to make sure everybody's on the same page of what needs to get done. Uh, there's a you know a, an air leakage test form in there, uh, something that you know if if you've got a a company that's uh, new or hasn't done an extensive amount of these, um, which often has occurred. Although we tried to to change that a little bit in the uh, in the UFGS uh, for some you know a, a little more experience and not the the fly by night companies. Uh, you know, but there there is that form there that that can be used. Um, you know, some some common things that come up during evaluation of the of the test results and things that can happen. Uh, obviously, in that test report you get after an air barrier test, you'll have I hopefully your company that does that will have identified the uh, areas in in need of attention, or if there's a full blown retest needed. And as well as your uh, thermal images from the, the thermal image requirement, so you know it's definitely when the, the QA is in the uh, in the three phase uh, in the preparatory meeting and going through that process, uh, particularly with the testing, that you know we, we hit these critical points and people are aware of them. So. Um, oh. uh, a few additional training resources. Uh, I'm one of the instructors and kind of the uh, the guy who put together most of the the content for uh, Prospect Class 126: uh, Building Air Barriers and Pressure Testing. Uh, we've this will be the fourth year we're doing this class. And uh, you know, if there's folks that are that are interested uh, in coming to that class, uh, we'll have I think we have one session this year. It's in the first couple of weeks of August, but it's in the uh, in the purple book. And I believe last time I looked, there was still uh, a handful of seats left. Uh, I think there was 10 to 12 seats left. So if you want more, um, we definitely have more. And, and we spend a week going over just about everything you could think of uh, related to, to air barriers and, and various things. and a lot of the content of this guide is uh, is further elaborated on in the uh, in the class but more focused on the air barrier content of this guide in that class so you know common issues with varying materials you know we talk about design and how to to make sure the designs are are okay during a design review and things so uh, we've also got a couple links here. Uh, the building envelope design guide on the whole building design uh, guide site. Uh, you know, the protocol is on there. And I think, as Eric had mentioned, this EP will be out for, is up for review for, for permanent uh, publication. So that might also be something that, that uh, pops up on here in the future. Uh, a couple of contacts uh, Jeanette Feast with uh, Northwest Division. She's kind of the lead on our uh, building envelopes, RECX. Um, myself, uh, Mr. Don Didis, he's the air barrier testing guru. Uh, both support her uh, in the in the building envelope RECX, and so she, uh, you know, she can. If you had questions, you could direct those uh, to her. Um, you can always, you know, direct questions to me as well. I've I've been answering questions you know for a number of years now when folks have issues so uh, just some good contacts there um, building envelopes RACX uh, has a number of folks that are uh, certified passive house consultants uh, including myself and so if you've kind of got something passive house in mind for a design we might be able to help you with that too so uh, and so with that uh, we'll we'll go on to the uh, questions portion here and uh, yeah Eric I, I don't know if there's uh, something for you yes. here um, yeah, basically, 
Yeah, basically, um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, what I've done is I've opened up a dialog box on the right-hand side of the screen, at the bottom of which uh, the attendees can see should see a text box uh, entry portal where they can type in their questions. They will show up in the white area above only to me, and I will um, consolidate any redundancies and uh, and read them uh, out loud for the sake of the recording and and for you to answer that way. Uh, so if people can take a minute to uh, go ahead and start typing in their questions, uh, then we can answer those uh, in the time that we have left. Uh, a couple other little uh, tidbits to mention. <clears throat> in the uh, web links box on the right hand uh, side of the screen next to the Q&A block that I just opened, um, there are links that you can click on and then click on the browse to button below where you can go to the, uh, the QA guide ECB that was published. Um, we also have a link there to our past webinars uh, that are available on our uh, private YouTube channel. Uh, or you can also get to there from the new Sustainability and Energy site, uh, the Mer MSRI, the Mercy site as we call it. Um, you will have to have a login and ID uh, and the instructions are on that to, uh, to get that information uh, to keep up with us. Um, if you know people that are interested in being able to attend these webinars and want to receive the announcements, uh, put in, uh, tell them to send an email to s underscore e webinar, all one word, at usace.army.mil. It's the same address to send your quizzes. And um, <clears throat> and then they will be able to get them on the uh, on the email list. And we're also going to send out an announcement globally, uh, basically asking for that same uh, process as we kick off uh, this new year. Um, we have a question from Bruce. Do you have data on ICF performance and failure points? Insulated concrete forms, I believe. Yes, I do. Um, we've done a couple of ICF uh, buildings out here, and I, I had uh, gone through and, and kind of extensively uh, looked over some of those issues. Um, you know, if you're if you're looking for uh, you know failure points and other issues that come up. Um, you know, generally the, the clear wall aspects of that uh, assembly are fine. It's cast, some of the big things that I had found was the, uh, the, the openings in ICF walls around windows and doors. Uh, oftentimes the concrete doesn't consolidate real well uh, in that wood form there. And so there can be little leakage points uh, that get through around those windows uh, through those vo that void space in there so um, I think that's a, a really critical one uh, with ICF we uh, did an ICF building here on Fort Carson it was a headquarters building and that building to my knowledge right now is the highest performing building envelope in all of the Army inventory and uh, I was present for the air barrier test and that building tested to a 0 .03 CFM per square foot. It had almost no leakage at all. And, uh, you know, the, the few tiny little leaks that it had were, were around uh, penetration. So uh, ICF is a really, really good thing if, you know, that the, the you know, windows and the doors and you know, depending on what kind of roof assembly you have, that that interface from the from the roof to the wall is addressed. The performance is excellent. Okay, um, I've got another question in here, which uh, I can add some to as a, as an update uh, after you're done with it. Um, but uh, the question is, there are a lot of materials in the industry today with various R and U values. Uh, are you aware of a link that? Uh, has data regarding their performance and applications. Uh, I believe I don't know if I have a link personally, but the national is it uh, National Fenestration Council um, FRC. No. Yes, FRC. Uh, and FRC. Na national. Something like that. Yes, the people that do the ratings. Yes, yes. I, I, I can't think of the name right off the top of my head, but um, there is a website out there and, and they have uh, information about Windows. I'm not ultim you know, really intimately familiar with all of the data they have, but uh, we've referenced that website before. Um, I, 
I think we could probably find that link and and uh, and send that over uh, to folks afterwards. Oh, and and same with the first question too is I could probably if someone wanted some pictures or something like that I could probably uh, send those uh, as out as well. Uh, yes, it's um, nfrc.org. That's National Fenestration yes. Rating Council. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, they do have a website. And, um, now, one thing is that um, of another initiative that we've been working on uh, in partnership with Navy and the Tri Service is uh, to enable vendors to be able to upload uh, test reports and, and product data on their various uh, uh, initiatives and products that they put out there uh, as a central resource that then uh, Army and other people uh, doing research can go to this library and find uh, data that they've uh, that they've uploaded and product information, uh, hopefully more uh, than just sales material, um, and that will be hosted on the whole building design guide uh, once we get it up and running. And that's uh, again uh, wbdg.org. So uh, hopefully that'll have uh, have something in, in our in our future. Uh, let's see a follow-up question uh, from Bruce. Do you imagine it would work? This is uh, about the ICFs. Uh, do you imagine it would work in the subtropics? I guess the concern there is getting too much humidity trapped inside the building. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a great wall system. It's very robust. I mean, you could the concrete wall systems precast, uh, tilt up, ICF, which is a cast in place. They all they're applicable in all climate types, um, you know, because they're they're well insulating. They have thermal mass, so they, they keep your your building very very thermally stable. Um, but I think Eric hit the nail on the head. Is uh, when you have a high performance building that has a a, a less leaky envelope, especially in uh, warm climates like in the south subtropic. Uh, that moisture control component becomes really critical. For an ICF wall, you're not going to have a lot of vapor transmission through that concrete. It, it just it doesn't happen. So that, that concrete itself is acting as a air, vapor, and water barrier. Uh, what it really boils down to is uh, making sure that, that indoor, the, the mechanical system is maintaining a, a low humidity or lower humidity at, um, relative humidity, so oftentimes 50% relative humidity uh, over your interior condition space temperatures is that max threshold you, you don't want to go over because, and, and not to get too in the weeds, but your, your molds, your mildews, and your moisture damage generally occurs at or above that point, and, and it can occur over a, a pretty wide range of temperatures. So. The answer to the question is yes, it would be perfectly fine. It would just be a matter of ensuring that uh, that interior uh, space is, is conditioned properly and, and there's moisture control. Right. And I think that it, the designers probably would have selected an ERV, uh, energy recovery uh, ventilation, uh, for the air to air heat exchanger uh, rather than an HRV, which is just mainly heating mode, because the ERVs are usually. Um, Designed to transfer the latent energy that you know, in other words, uh, transfer some of that um, that that humidity uh, into the outgoing air from the incoming air. Um, so that's another thing to look for. Um, but there's a software package, I believe it's called Woofy. Um, yes. Can't remember what Woofy stands for. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Woofy is I don't remember what the acronym stands for either, but it's a software. It's a hydrothermal modeling software that was developed by Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and uh, it's taken on several evolutions in the last couple of years as folks have uh, become more aware of the the energy impacts of high performance building envelopes um, and how how that. Uh, how important that is, but it's also critical that uh, that when you are doing these, especially depending on which wall type you have, that you understand the the moisture behavior of the atmosphere that's going, you know, that uh, surrounds that wall on both the interior side of the wall and the exterior side, and that software um, models uh, the the moisture, the hydrothermal behavior. 
the, the moisture behavior of a wall assembly over various conditions through different seasons and temperatures. And so that's a really, really uh, excellent piece of software that uh, designers can uh, utilize to, to model their wall assemblies to, uh, to really reduce the, uh, the moisture damage, mold, mildew, degradation, all that fun stuff, uh, that risk there. And another thing too is is uh, energy recovery and, and these things are important. But if you're in the subtropics, your main load is going to be cooling load uh, during you know during the, the warmer periods. And oftentimes in the subtropics, where the, the the cooling load and the and the exterior temperature and moisture load uh, are really important, so you don't have condensation issues in the building. And that's why that you know, uh, condensation um, or uh, moisture, uh, uh, condensation coils or dehumidification coils in the mechanical system is really important so that you're, you're dropping that moisture down, that relative humidity down in your conditioned space so that you're not, uh, not going to have condensation issues in the walls and the roof and, and it could even be on surfaces in the, uh, in the building. Okay, um, we're a little bit past the hour, so I'll finish with this uh, one question. Uh, it seems like a general question. Um, does anyone have recommendations for a good resource to find replacement siding uh, for a redwood siding building with no insulation? <laughs> uh, any good websites? Um, I think maybe to answer that one, if anybody knows of a good siding replacement uh, process, uh, would forward those to uh, Annette Stump. Uh, she's in the global. Uh, and if you have any information, uh, Nicholas, you can uh, talk to that, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, I really don't have uh, something right off the top of my head about that. Um, you know, my my thought would be um, if you're looking for something material specific, uh, you know, you you might. This is probably pretty vague, but you might just look around in town and see. You know who your who your siding suppliers are, or, um, you know, and the different uh, products they carry. Um, you know, I'm if, if you're thinking of uh, any kind of exterior claddings or anything like that. Um, you know, some of the new products like uh, cement board, uh, fiber cement siding, and some of these things are are really durable. Um, you know, redwood is is a you know very you know uh, uh, degradation resistant wood. Uh, same with cedar too. But yeah, my best thought is is you know try and, and poke around at, at folks locally and and see if you can find suppliers for the material. Uh, you know, on a on a wall that has no insulation. You know, uh, there's a, a thing called the perfect wall. If it has no interior insulation, that's good. And in a perfect wall assembly, it's a cavity wall assembly where all that insulation is on the exterior. So um, one of the things about a lot of older houses is that they're built with loose fill or, or insulation on the inside of the cavity wall. And then they've just got a siding, which is your rain screen, and there's no layer in between. And it's, you know, there's just a substrate behind it that's, that's leaky. And if you're thinking about renovating, you know, uh, a core, an older core building on the civil work site, or even your, you know, your own personal house, uh, it's really important to know, especially if the house is older, that uh, you know, if you if you pull that siding off and put up a, an air barrier layer or an air water uh, vapor control layer, uh, and then put new siding on the outside, that you you've changed the behavior of that wall, and and sometimes. Old houses are best left leaky. You know, you see those old farmhouses that have been around for 110 years. They're still standing, but you pull apart the wall and you see you can see moisture uh, damage in there, or moisture staining in there, but the wood hasn't rotted. Um, you know, the, the thought is that there is some moisture um, durability in most materials to address, you know, periodic wetting and drying. But the key is. Uh, is if it gets wet, it's allowed to dry. So, 
Okay. I don't know um, if that really answers I, the question other than... Uh, uh, well, I, I think uh, yes, you echoed it back to the fiber cement. Um, now, I put a link in the web links box. I accidentally overwrote the one for our webinar, but um, the uh, for the WUFI site, uh, W-U-F-I uh, D-E, uh, I believe it's a partnership with Germany, and they use a lot of that stuff uh, over there. Uh, they're big on the passive house thing. So um, I'll leave this portal open a bit uh, for people to get these websites down and all of that. And uh, I thank you all for coming, and I look forward to our, our announcements uh, for the next webinars and for those uh, that want to sign up to uh, to be on the email list to get webinars. Uh, thank you all very much for your time, and especially uh, Nicholas Alexander for your presentation. Yes, thanks, Eric, for having me, and uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully, folks enjoyed it.